stop beating yourself up. You have chosen, I'm not going to worship Satan anymore. I'm not going to live for Satan anymore. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, I'm going after Almighty God fully, completely. I, I, I give myself to Him totally. My mind, I give myself to Him. My body, I give myself to Him. My heart, my will, my desires, I give myself to Him. I will live for God. I give Him my total, my complete yes. And I tell Satan no to everything. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. This, this, is, this has been burning on my heart since uh, I was standing where I was last time. Ephesians, Galatians, Ephesians, page uh, 1,390, if you have a Bible just like mine. <laughs> Chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Be imitators of God as dear children. Uh, if Grace does something that she shouldn't, everyone looks at me and says, she's just like you, Grandpa. <laughs> any bad trait, any bad thing Grace does, who's to blame? Because she's imitating who? The one she adores. <laughs> it's that simple, you know? And as we adore Almighty God, and the only way we can adore Him is to get into this book and see him. Only this book reveals who God truly is. His nature, his character, his heart, the things he loves, the things he hates. Only this book spells it out in black and white. This book is so simple, even a child can understand it. Amen? Amen. If you have a hard time reading this book, I recommend you go to the app, Superbooks, download it, and I tell you what, it's the most incredible. It's cartoons. But I used to read the picture Bible for about 10, 15 years, the first 10, 15 years of my salvation. I kid you not. I'd read the King James. I'd read the Amplified. But I loved the picture Bible because it put a picture in my mind. There's Joshua. There's the walls of Jericho. Or I would turn on a cassette tape to date myself. That was before CDs came out, but after 8-track, so I'm not that old. <laughs> and, I would listen, and I would listen to the Bible and read along with it. So I would learn how to pronounce half of the names, probably improperly. I don't know if uh, Alexander Scorby said them correctly with his English accent, but nevertheless... I would read along and, and go over all the epistles, go over all the gospels in a week's time, over and over and over and over and over. And I got to know who Jesus was. And because of that, I started to imitate him almost effortlessly. The line totally disappeared. The incorrect thinking almost totally disappeared. The talking was totally cleaned up. The behavior, the response to people, I became slightly more and more and more and more and more like Jesus. Denise would like to say, uh, I'd like to see that moment. <laughs> but that's how it happens. You imitate the one you adore. You imitate the one you're constantly looking at. You imitate the one you hold up as something special. And the only way you're going to see God, the one true living God, is to get into this book. Amen? Amen. Just read it. Just read it and read it. And re you may not understand all of it. That's fine, but get into the book. Amen? So Ephesians says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ Jesus. 
He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. We need to be a pleasing aroma to God like Jesus Christ was. How do we do that? We walk in love. We have to be filled with love. Romans chapter 5 says the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. The love of God has been shed, has been shed abroad in your heart. You are absolutely, totally, completely full to the max with the love of God. God is love. If you have the love of God living in you to that degree, that means you have God in you to that degree. God's love. Our response, you have God's nature in you. Our, his, our response to any given situation should be love, should be kindness, should be patience. All the fruit of the Spirit, amen? But imitate God in everything you do. Now let's turn to John chapter 8 and verse 44. What I'm getting at is we have two fathers that we can choose from. Father A, Almighty God, or the second father, would someone like to tell me who that would be? Someone said it, Satan. Everyone say Satan. Satan. Oh, thank God we're not in that camp, amen? And thank God as Christians, we clearly, plainly see it. There's Almighty God. We love him. We worship him. He's good, and he's good all the time, amen? Amen. Satan, he's bad, and he's bad all the time. Amen? If something bad is going on, it's Satan. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. God has come to bless you, to lift you, to prosper you, to increase you, to give you a life of success. Amen? Amen? Amen. Verse 44 of John's Gospel, chapter 8. You are of your father... This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, Sadducees, doctors of the law, the religious people that put people in bondage with all their tradition, doctrine of men. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Think of, think of the things the devil has people doing that causes great bondage, great distress, great remorse, great heartache. And it says the desires of your father you want to do. There's either almighty God that we can serve or there's God of this world, Satan, that we can serve. Thank God everyone in here has chosen, I'm going to serve the one true living God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Amen? Amen. Because this guy over here, Satan, All he's going to do is cause your life to end up in ruin. When Michelle was a a little girl, we told her this superstar is going to end up in ruin. She said, how do you know that? And we said, well, you have, and then we proceeded to name the names, and some of you would know them. First names, you could go just first names. If I said Michael, Michael you would know. If I said Elvis, you would know. If I said, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. Brittany? (coughs) And Michelle said, how do you know? You can't give your life over to Satan. You say, well, how do you know they were serving Satan? Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. You say, you can't judge people. Oh, yes, I can. uh, And and Paul said in Corinthians, isn't there one spiritual? Isn't there even just one spiritual enough amongst you to judge in these earthly matters? Y'all remember reading that? Don't you know when you go to heaven, you are going to judge the very angels of heaven? (laughs) That's in the Bible. We make judgments all the time. We make a judgment whether we want to go to this restaurant or that restaurant. What item to buy in the grocery store? What clothes to put on? (coughs) Excuse me. We're constantly making judgments. And we need to make judgments. We need to make judgments concerning uh, our political leaders. 
Do we want someone that is bent and determined on being godly, living a godly life, or determined to live a godless life? We need to make judgments. Can everyone agree with that? I mean, it's pretty simple. Don't judge me is coming from a group of people that want to be uh, carefree, wild, do their own thing. Don't you tell me I can't do something. I want all the restraints taken off. There has to be restraints. We need to live with restraints. We need to live within the boundaries of this book. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And it's not legalism. It's joy. It's peace. It's freedom. If I told little Grace, (coughs) you go out there and just play. And I didn't say, here's the boundary. You don't go past the tree in the front yard because you're too close to to the street that wouldn't be a good father. And God realizes he has to put restrictions on us, boundaries on us, amen, so that we don't get hit by a car. Amen. So we have a choice. In in today's world, what's going on right now, I believe we're seeing a revival. And it is a subtle thing, and it's a groundswell, and it's rising up in a mighty and profound way. There's a revival going on. And it seems to be, this, and this is wild to me. I don't think we've ever, 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 ever have seen something like what's going on. And in, unless you know where to look, You'll, you'll totally miss it, which is another key indicator of God doing something. God likes to do something. He likes to do things that we've never seen, we've never experienced. He likes to shake us up. I've been saved over 45 years, born again, spirit-filled, going after God with every fiber of my being. I got radically saved, and I just can't shake it. And I don't want to. And he is doing something to shake me up. Because I picture revival happening like this. This is how it has to happen. And Denise has taught me, no, 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 no. It doesn't have to be dramatic, dynamic, uh, loud, exciting, fun. (laughs) It can be subtle. It can be very, very Baptist. And I'm like, God cannot move like that. And she says, oh, yes, he can. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Holy Ghost. (laughs) 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 And and she's like, no, you're incorrect. And it, it breaks my heart. It's like, God Do something to her. Fix her. Change her. (laughs) And and, uh, to give an illustration of this, we were in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Okay? And uh, everyone speaks French. Everybody. And I have an interpreter. And some of the phrases we use, uh, birds of a feather flock together. They've never heard it. Doesn't make sense. Can't translate. They they can't figure it out. And you'd give example after example after example, and they're like their brains just jarred. Idioms. Yeah, idioms. Thank you. And uh, everyone's French, and they're very much like me. They love the Holy Ghost. Love the move of the Holy Ghost. Love the power of God. Love just uh, totally comfortable with with the move of the Holy Ghost. But the pastor's daughter. She, uh, she has uh, ovarian cancer, and she's, she's dying. And she's on the television for the networks in, in Quebec, and they're chronologically going along 
her journey of death, giving her like a five-minute segment every night. How morbid. But that's what they were doing. So everyone in Quebec, a, a massive province, knows she's dying and she's being spotlighted. You know, her, her emotional journey, her physical journey of death. And she's sitting in the back. She's mad at God. She's, you know, her biological clock's ticking. She wants to get married, and she, that's not going to happen. She wants to have a baby, and that's not going to happen. And she's dying, and she doesn't want that to happen. And uh, the people are being slain in the spirit. They're falling out. I'm totally comfortable with it. Some people aren't. It's like, it's in the Bible. Get comfortable. And uh, Denise goes back, to my amazement, and brings her up to me. And uh, Denise says, you be kind to her, and you be gentle, and you speak softly. Do you hear me? <laughs> and uh, I'm like... Well, God just was put in a box. Nothing's going to happen. And uh, so I, I said a sweet little prayer. And I thought, oh, man. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so she turns to walk away. And my hand's on, on the back of her head as she takes a step away. And uh, I'm like, Dear God, Denise is going to kill me. <laughs> what did I just do? And this lady, she turns around and, and, and tears flowing down her face. She says in broken English, I know what you just did. And I'm like, tell me because I'm clueless. <laughs> I mean, spontaneous. My hand's up there. And uh, I said, well, please tell me. And she says, you got me plugged in. I said, what do you mean I've got you plugged in? She said, she said, high, high voltage electricity is coursing through my body. I said, I said, sister, God's healing you right this moment. You're totally healed. Do you hear me? Totally healed. Hallelujah. Well, she, she was totally healed. All this is six months. Every six months they had us come back because it was just radical miracles. And, and then Denise tells her, uh, God's going to give you a husband and uh, he showed me what, he's gonna, what he looks like. And uh, so she brings him in. We come back six months later. And uh, she says, is this the guy? And then he said, no, that's not the guy. He, he, he had this thick, beautiful, curly hair. And the lady starts sobbing. She says, she pulls out a picture of him. She said, this morning he shaved his head. This is what he looked like. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> it was the same guy. And Denise says, well, that's him. I'm not saying marry him. That's between you and him. But I'm telling you, that's who God showed me. So they get married. They have us back because, you know, they, hey, they got married and, and she's totally healed. And Denise says, when we come back, no, before this year's over, you're going to have a, a baby boy. And we were always taught when you prophesy, you never say male or female. You just say you're going to have a baby. I don't know what's either you're right or you're right, you know. And uh, it was so it was so supernatural. These French people that are leaning towards separatists. You'd have to be kind of Canadian to understand all this. Have any of you ever heard the separatists? They, they, the French don't really want to be part of. English speaking Canadian Canada, but uh, they named the baby Victor. They gave the Frenchman gave the baby an English name because there's victory in Jesus. Amen. This is the God we serve. You have Almighty God, the God of the supernatural, or you have. The God of this world that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Kill, steal, and destroy. And people have a choice who they're going to serve. Are they going to serve Almighty God or are they going to serve Satan, the God of this world? Turn to Romans 
chapter 8. A lot of us have made very poor decisions, and we're not proud of them. And as you go on in your Christian life, the Bible says to, that we need to renew our mind. And we renew our mind by doing what? Getting into the Word of God. Only the Word of God. It will wash you clean. You'll be so clean. You, it'll be like a, a, a dream that you had uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago that you can vaguely remember. I think I did some goofy things when I was younger, 20 years ago, but you've so renewed your mind. And it's like you've so cast down vain imaginations that you can't hardly remember these things anymore. You can't remember them. And and the guilt and the shame, the remorse, the heart, it's gone. Amen? You can't rewind the VHS tape and record over it. Remember doing that back in the day? I mean, it's there forever, but it's washed by the blood. And Jesus, he takes it, God takes it and casts it as far as the east is from the west. It's gone in his sight. And if he can't remember it, God cannot remember your sin when it's under the blood of Jesus, then why do you keep remembering it? Just don't even think about it. It's, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven, I am forgiven I refuse to think about it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is no condemnation. Stop beating yourself up. You have chosen... I'm not going to worship Satan anymore. I'm not going to live for Satan anymore. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, I'm going after Almighty God fully, completely. I I, I give myself to Him totally. My mind, I give myself to Him. My body, I give myself to Him. My heart, my will, my desires, I give myself to Him. I will live for God. I give Him my total, my complete yes. And I tell Satan, no, to everything. Sin is but for a, yeah, the, the, the pleasure of sin is but for a moment. The wages of sin is death. Oh, that sounds marvelous. No to him, but I want life and I want to experience the kingdom of God in the here and now. Amen. There's no condemnation. There's no shame. Everyone say amen. Amen. No shame. No shame. No shame. Do you know this place would be packed like it was last weekend if people would realize there's no shame? We hear constantly as we go through this little town, I have such shame I can't step into a church. Our job as ambassadors to the kingdom of God is to tell people this verse, there is no condemnation. There is no shame. Amen? Amen. Let people know God has totally, completely forgiven you. You, In his mind, you are as right as what Christ Jesus is. They're not even saved yet. But tell them that. God has, has so made everything correct, made everything right with him, now it's your turn to respond to that. You need to tell your, your God, your Savior, Jesus, that you accept him, that you accept his salvation. You need to receive him into your heart as Lord, Master, and Savior. Tell people that, amen? Let them know there's no shame, no condemnation. Glory to God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Turn to Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. Hallelujah. There's a revival going on.
We've, we've seen massive crusades. I, I, I'm just trying to wake up to what's going on, trying to figure it out, trying to get my ear to the ground, but it's happening. There's been massive crusades. Thank God they're happening. I was listening to Greg Lowry last night. Uh, he's with one of the leaders of Calvary Chapel. They baptized over 6,000 people at Pirate's Cove where they had the Jesus movement back in the 70s. Over 6,000 people at one time. That's kind of amazing. Last month, this little group of people here, uh, we baptized 12, and we don't even have a place to baptize them. And they said the water was so cold. <laughs> Welcome to Montana in the middle of summer. Hallelujah. <laughs> you were so numb from the cold. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We're seeing things happen, guys. We, we heard over and over and over and over again. Uh, 155 kids, 55 volunteers. You must be doing something right. I said, no, we're not doing anything right, but Almighty God is doing great things through us. And it was shocking to me. You hear it two or three times. It's like, but after a while, God keeps pounding. You must be doing something right. You must be doing something right. You must be doing something right. It's the love that you guys have for each other. It's the love you guys have for Almighty God. It's the love that you guys have for Miss Denise saying, bow your heads with no one looking around. <laughs> with only one plea, or Mike saying, let's have some Holy Ghost time. <laughs> and it's like, either way, God's going to move. Amen? He'll move through a gentle breeze. He'll move through a mighty wind. All I want is for him to move. All I want is for a group of people that realize Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy a group of people that want nothing to do with his kingdom because they've seen this marvelous Jesus and they're absolutely enamored in love with him. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. Did I give you the chapter already? This is powerful. You need to mark it in your Bible. The God of peace will crush Satan, period. Someone say, no, 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 no. <laughs> what does it say? The God of peace will crush Satan, period. Under your feet. What does it say? Everyone say, under my feet. The God of peace will crush Satan under whose feet? How is it going to happen? It's going to happen by you keeping your eyes on Almighty God and being in love with Him. Reading this book over and over and over and over. Putting a cassette tape on, just closing your eyes and listening to it. Picturing what's going on. Uh, going to Superbook and watching the cartoon with your kids. It is the most accurate thing I've ever watched in my life. CBN did a phenomenal job putting that together. Your kids will learn the Bible. You'll learn, learn the Bible. It's incredible. <sighs> what do we need to do? We, we are in the ministry. You've been drafted. Everyone say, yippee. Yeah. <laughs> You've been drafted. Now, you have to think of ministry. I've been working on this a little bit. You have to think of ministry not as a television ministry because that's what we see and that's what we think of. I'm going to have 55 people answering the telephone. Please donate $150, $25 every month. That's not the ministry we're talking about. We're not talking about getting in a car, flying around the nation, speaking at different places around the nation. Amen? What are we talking about? In your occupation, 
the job you have. If you're a housewife, that's the job God's given you. If you're an educator, whatever position you have in life, that is the position you minister from. Amen? Amen. But from that position, you can be so lit up for God that you glow in the dark. My heart's desire is that each one of you, and I'm not going into Weirdville here, that each one of you glow in the dark. Wouldn't that be sweet? No more power, Bill. (laughs) You say, what's that about, Mike? Moses, his face lit up. The Israelites couldn't stand it. When he came down from Mount Sinai, he had to put a veil over his face. The power of God, the glory of God was radiating off of his face. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, Jesus, Mount Transfiguration. James, Peter, and and John uh, were there. Peter said, let's build a tabernacle. Uh, The glory of God was so coming out of Jesus, his very clothing was even transfigured. It became white, whiter than any dry cleaner in today's vernacular could ever make them. Can you imagine that? The, 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 The light of God was shooting out of his clothes, off of his face. Stephen, you say, well, that was Moses and Jesus. Bring it down to my level. Stephen was a table waiter. Just a normal Joe. He wasn't a, an apostle. He was just a Christian. And, and Stephen, the first martyr of the church, I think it's Acts chapter 7, somewhere in there, early part of Acts. Uh, they're stoning him, and his face shone like an angel. We have within us the glory of God. Christ in you, the hope of glory Christ in you the hope of glory we have the glory of God in us we have Christ in us we can fan the flame stir up the gift pray in the Holy Ghost get into this word until we're lit up Smith Wigglesworth how many of you have ever heard of Smith Wigglesworth he was a plumber he had a third grade education I believe maybe not even that much but he was a plumber his wife was the preacher he was in love with God, but she was the preacher. And then God got a hold of him. And he slowly worked his way out of plumbing because he was on high demand and all he could do was preach. But he slowly worked out of plumbing because he didn't have time. People said, come pray for me, come pray for me, come pray for me. And they would see the most radical, notable, noticeable miracles, incredible things. Here's basically an illiterate man. They said when he spoke, the first part of the sentence had nothing to do with the last part of the sentence. It's like he couldn't keep his thought. He'd mispronounce words. And yet God used him mightily, raised over 12 people from the dead, absolutely confirmed, totally, completely, 100% dead, Smith Wigglesworth. If God can do that with a guy like that, a plumber, what could he do with you? What could he do with me? It's up to us to give God our complete yes, our total yes. Amen? Amen. So being, at least I'm consistent. That was my introduction. Next time I speak, (laughs) I'll give you point one. (laughs) Hallelujah. I want to finish early. Is is anyone just burning? uh, would, Would anyone in here like me to lay hands on them and pray for you? You want me to, dear? Here, come on up. Come on. If you want me to pray for you, come. Just come up. 